a portrait, a symphony, an ocean. The first poem is Creating Light on Cape May. And Cape May is a street in San Diego. What happened is that in the first week of school, I'm a teacher, first week of school I had to move out and find a place and furnish it. Um, And as we know in Hawaii, finding a place is not easy, and it's the same in San Diego. So anyway, uh, a friend um, helped me with the whole process, two friends actually, Help me with the whole process. This is the poem. Creating light on Cape May for Kumu'ao with gratitude. So the days have knitted themselves together like a fishnet hand-knotted and cast out in a private lagoon. Days were snagged and held together as if one. That's what happens if you don't sleep for days. You bubble up like the old buoys of sea glass, lassoed together by a roped cord. It's been a blur of rental units, lists of moving companies, sofas in consignment shops. I pass lacquered desks, the color of high-gloss butterscotch, and mirrors 12 feet in height next to 1920s vanities. Vanity is what you lose when you're looking for a place to live. Where do mermaids go when they are stranded on land? A friend of mine seems to know. She pulls a lamp of celadon glass next to a Moroccan table and pillows of each shade of green, from sea foam to teal with suggestions of silver. She seems to know how one can live without water on land, what's needed to make that work. How high does that table need to be, she asks, whipping out her tape measure. Later, she finds an elegant table in the shape of a hanging trumpet flower with cutouts as delicate and porous as honeycombs. She places it at the head of the bed near the window, so when you sleep, an orchid grows above you as if a stairway to the gods and to the heavens. All this feeds blood back into my veins, so that I can return to the colors of blue. My head lifts higher as I walk, away from the desert and dry heat, back into the ocean. She's built stone by stone, a way for someone from the sea to live in air, to live this way on land. As she drives away, I see a corner of her own blue-colored sleeve, And behind her, the air moves like white water entwined with aquamarine. And she recedes back into her own ocean, ripples trailing behind in her wake. The next poem is Upon Listening to Respighi's Pines of Rome. What happened is a friend sent me a link to uh, this very young orchestra playing this symphonic piece, and this was my response or reaction to that piece. Upon listening to Respighi's Pines of Rome for Eric Caldera. Some sounds are holy, moving us like the golden section of a shell. We are captured, yet free, at the same time. How do these young musicians stay tethered to the ground when they are playing so, having transcended the discipline of study into the ecstatic embodiment of sound? Layer upon layer builds, a stratum of tempo and notes, risking such vulnerability, for at any moment their technique could fail but they remain fixed on moving this great armada of sound onward through the souls of themselves and all those present. Aren't we all changed after this, choosing to live another life, now charged with being, to be grander, sweeter, fuller, more cognizant of the intricate pieces that hold together the world, as if by listening, 
we have drunk from the transcendent and in an alchemy changed forever, never again to be small. This next poem is Different Kinds of Oceans, and it's for all the good and kind people who listen to someone um, who has something to tell them. Different Kinds of Oceans. An ocean of tears lies in me, and sometimes new waves rise. Today the language admonishes women or the wounded. Don't be a victim. They forbid the emotions born from violence. Violence creates waves and waves and waves and waves that never reach ashore, at least not for me. So I submerge. I close my eyes and drift like the young girl in Whale Rider or the corseted woman in the piano. The protagonist embraces the mother ocean who accepts her just as she is, who listens to her will even if it has atrophied from neglect or misuse. And because someone listens, choice remains. So we may unwind the rope around our ankle. We may cease to embrace the descending whale. And we may allow ourselves the rise to the surface, but only as slowly as we can bear. This piece of mine is called Disc Flowers. It is a remembering, a rekindling of the past, the present, and the unknowing future. But at the same time, it's also undone. Here's Disc Flowers. Have I been searching, tilting only others on divine petal, while wilting, plucking at my own body, existence. A whirl of pistil separation has intervened. I'm feuding for fusion, hoping hope is received peacefully at my stigmas, my fingertips. unlearning false actions. No other shall determine my worth or not. No judgment there for when it comes to my beauties. There is no adequate enough to tolerate my intricacies, hands not soft enough, wide enough to catch even droplet of my galaxy pressed between my lips. Scattered when the crevices of my mouth rise as blades of grass calling home to sun, divinely orchestrated. Do not tamper with magical marks once placed intentionally, for they will each serve their purpose soon enough. Do not pierce through what is not broken. open clouded parts of you as flower and a bee searching to rendezvous. For this is where light pours in and lives. 
let me peel back an arch like outer crescent moon connected to Orion's belt visible for all the world the celestial equator feeds me the night sky I have never been ready for this I'm still waiting to be ready for this. All of this that is me, these bits still scattered in night sky, waiting for me to feed. I stumble. Wonderfully, my words are oblique and dressed in this cape, and they are triggered like stars. For I am somewhere, somewhere in there, spilled in their corners. Make the Cut by Erica Brown. The rejection email came into my inbox in the same way the rest of my emails do, with no added weight. It read sweetly and not at all mean, but my poem had not made the final cut for the literary magazine. But I was still invited to make a donation and click on a link and read the poems published. So I read them all out loud. And wow, I was touched and moved reading their beautiful artistry. Each a weave of ladybugs, wings, life, pandemic, loss, and morning dew. As I read them, some then jumped out of the page and crept deep inside of me. It was sorrow and sadness, but not because my angel poem didn't make the cut. It was something heavier, and only in retrospect, an other though poise. This was a compilation of collective sadness. It was a tonnage, and its heaviness came from life lived by the authors. It was all anguish in the authors' voices. It was the aggregate, that huge pile of steaming anguish I felt it all creeping and filling the crevices of my porous bones. It made me forget all the angel fluff and wings that my poem had. These poems spelled out an insurmountable loss, all written in 12 font despair Franklin Gothic heavy lines. Indenting angst, not just on the page, but in the in, indenting a crater into my gut. Now, I'm no angel, you see. So it just all became too much for me. There's sorrow so strong, like muscles holding me down. I had to shake off their angst. And so off onto the cold on a walk I went. I hunkered down into my coat, as misery lining us both. I walked following a labyrinth of pain, all this leading 
me to wonder about the editor at large. Was he, she, they suffering thus? Or was he, she, they an angel that could house so much loss and still breathe right? Did she, he, they need to read, feel, and taste all the pain again on a page? Maybe pain deserves to be honored this way. Suffering has not diminished or even changed with age and time. But my ability to hold on to so much of it seems to have weaned over time. Hmm. I wonder if angel wings could bring back my fortitude and make me fireproof again. Are angel wings made to sustain the kind of pain that burns a hole through? The pothole on the street reminded me that sidestepping pain is a thing. After this long walk and breathing in and out the cool evening air, it finally felt okay to say goodnight to all the sorrow that I was holding in so tight and none of it was mine. So I told myself that the only sorrow I could carry inside was the sorrow I had caused today. But for once and on this day, I happily said out loud, I have been an angel as I have not hurt anything, not even a fly. And better yet, I have not caused anyone any harm. So I looked up to the sky and I yelled out into the night, do I make the angel cut now? Don't I deserve wings now? But as I yelled, I thought about this a bit more and so, ooh, I whispered, wait. Maybe I can get angel wings tomorrow. Scratch the plan for tonight. Tomorrow, tomorrow I will be ready to shoulder some of the world's pain again. But tonight, I'm just done.